government's ongoing monitoring and testing programme, as of today, 669,850 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 29,058 tests carried out yesterday. 152,840 people have tested positive, and that's an increase of 4,463 cases since yesterday. 15,953 people are currently in hospital with the coronavirus in the UK, down from 16,411 on the 25th of April. And sadly, of those hospitalised with the virus, 20,732 have now died, and that is an increase to 413 fatalities since yesterday. But we express our deepest condolences to the families and friends of these victims. At the beginning of the outbreak of this virus, we saw significant problems in panic buying. That episode quickly subsided, and food availability now is back to normal levels and has been for several weeks. All supermarkets have introduced social distancing measures to protect both their staff and their customers, and it is essential that shoppers respect these measures. The food supply chain has also seen a significant reduction in staff absence over recent weeks, as staff who had been self-isolating through suspected coronavirus have returned to work. So absence levels are down from a peak of typically 20% in food businesses three weeks ago to less than 10% at the end of last week and in some cases uh, individual companies reporting absences as low as 6%. We have put in place measures to support the clinically vulnerable. So far 500,000 food parcels have been delivered to the shielded group, that is those who cannot leave home at all due to a clinical condition that they have. And in addition, the major supermarkets have agreed to prioritise delivery slots for those in this shielded group. And so far, over 300,000 such deliveries have been made, enabling people to shop normally and choose the goods that they want to buy. We recognise that there are others who are not clinically vulnerable and therefore not in that shielded group, but who may also be in need of help perhaps through having a disability or another type of medical condition, or indeed being unable to draw on family and neighbours to help them. So we have been working with local authorities to ensure that those people can be allocated a volunteer shopper uh, to help them get their food needs. And charities such as Age UK and others can now also make direct referrals uh, on the Good Samaritan app uh, to locate volunteers for those in need. Many supermarkets have taken steps to increase the number of delivery slots that they have. Uh, at the beginning of this virus outbreak, there were typically 2.1 million delivery slots uh, in the entire supermarket chain. That has now increased to 2.6 million, and over the next couple of weeks, uh, we anticipate that that will grow further to 2.9 million. So supermarkets have taken steps to increase their capacity. But uh, while this capacity has expanded, it will still not be enough to meet all of the demand that is out there. Some supermarkets have already chosen to prioritise some vulnerable customers with a proportion of the delivery slots that they have. And others have offered to work with us and also with local authorities to help establish a referral system so that when somebody is in desperate need, a local authority is able to make a referral to ensure that they can get a priority slot. As we look forward more generally towards the next stage in our battle against this virus, there are encouraging signs of progress. But before we consider it safe to adjust any of the current social distancing measures, we must be satisfied that we have met the five tests set out last week by the First Secretary. Those tests mean that the NHS can continue to cope, that the daily death rate falls sustainably and consistently, that the rate of infection is decreasing and operational challenges have been met, and most important of all, that there is no risk of a second peak. For now, the most important thing that we can all do to stop the spread of the coronavirus is to stay at home, 
to protect the NHS and save lives. Thank you. And I would now like to pass over to Stephen Powis, who will give you a further update. Thank you, Secretary of State, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to take you through some familiar slides which uh, indicate uh, how this epidemic is progressing in the UK. Uh, the first couple uh, relate to the use of transport, and you will have seen these before. So the first uh, shows uh, public transport usage uh, throughout the UK and in London, uh, together with uh, motor uh, vehicle transport uh, uh, usage. And you will see we continue to see a great reduction in the number of journeys taken on public transport and also a decrease in the use of motor vehicles. There is uh, maybe the hint of a little bit of an increase in the use of motor vehicles. And as I said yesterday, I think we need to ensure that this uh, does not mean uh, that we are uh, not continuing to uh, comply with the government instructions on social distancing, which are, of course, so key uh, to ensuring that we get uh, on top and control the spread of this virus. The next slide, which again uh, I showed you yesterday, uh, is data taken from the use of Apple Maps uh, as an example uh, of uh, uh, people uh, going out and about. So it looks at uh, the uh, requests uh, for directions in Apple Maps. And again, this shows uh, decline uh, from the start of the uh, introduction of social distancing on public transport, but also requests for directions for walking and driving. Although again, you can see there might be a little hint there uh, of an increase in walking and driving. And again, uh, must emphasize how important it is that we comply with those social distancing uh, measures. Uh, and the reason that's important, of course, is shown in the next set of slides, the first of which uh, shows the number of new cases determined by testing uh, in the UK. And you can see that the benefit of social distancing is beginning uh, to be reflected uh, in the number of new cases determined by testing. We are not seeing increases in that. We are seeing uh, a fairly stable number. And that, of course, is also on the backdrop of an increased number of tests becoming available. That, in turn, of course, uh, uh, then plays through into the number of hospital admissions. Again, for the vast majority of people, this is a mild illness. But unfortunately for some, it requires a hospital uh, stay, a hospital admission. And you can see that we now have a very definite trend uh, in uh, a reduced number of people in hospitals. That is most marked in London. But I think you can also see that uh, in the Midlands uh, and the beginnings of that in other uh, areas uh, of the, uh, the UK. Uh, and so that uh, is definitely showing uh, that our compliance with social distancing is proving to be uh, beneficial. It is reducing uh, the uh, transmission and spread uh, of the virus. And of course, uh, for those, uh, unfortunately, who are more critically ill, again, a minority, uh, in the next slide, uh, you can see the proportion of critical care beds uh, that are being uh, uh, used uh, for uh, COVID-19 patients in the UK. And you can see that proportion is declining, as indeed uh, is the absolute number. So again, evidence that all the hard work everybody in the country has been doing to maintain those social distancing rules uh, is paying off. And then uh, finally, the last couple of slides are deaths. Uh, all deaths uh, are, are tragic, and, um, and my heart goes out to all uh, those who've been affected by deaths of loved ones. Uh, the number of deaths in hospitals shown here is now starting to decline. Uh, the deaths outside hospitals are reported differently, and I'll show you data on that in a minute. Uh, but this is absolutely because uh, we as a British public uh, have paid attention to the social distancing guidance uh, we have been given. And then finally, the last slide uh, is an international comparison. Uh, and there are two lines here for the UK. The first is hospital deaths, which we can report very quickly. Uh, but then also uh, you will see uh, a line now at around day 24, 25 uh, in all settings, which includes data that becomes available through the Office for National Statistics. That includes all deaths. Uh, but because of the way that deaths are reported out of hospital, there is a lag uh, in reporting that. Uh, it is updated weekly, and we are looking at ways in which we can uh, ensure that that reporting uh, is done quicker, but there will inevitably be uh, a lag on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to um, turn to questions, starting with uh, David Shukman from the BBC. Thank you very much indeed. A couple of questions, if I may. Um, first of all, in the modelling of the infection rate and the different measures, the effect that they have on that rate, 
it's pretty clear that reopening schools has one of the least impacts on increasing the rate. Might it be that when you look at relaxing different measures, reopening schools might be one of the first things you can... And on the second point on testing, we have uh, been ramping up our capacity to do those tests. Currently stands at over 50 day, and we have started to invite uh, large numbers of people now working in the care sector and care homes uh, to uh, undertake those tests, and significant numbers have. I might now pass over to uh, Stephen, who may have the precise number. Yes, thank you, David. So, so I think a few days ago, the Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, gave a very clear description here at this podium uh, of the sort of uh, strategy uh, that scientifically we would have to uh, think about adopting in order to ensure that we don't see a rise uh, in infection in the spread uh, of the virus uh, in uh, the forthcoming months. Uh, and, it, and in order to make sure that we don't put ourselves at risk of a, of a second peak uh, of uh, uh, infections. Uh, and that's broadly to, to make sure uh, that we keep the transmission rate below that uh, number that we always talk about, that R of 1, which essentially means ensuring uh, that we don't go back to a situation uh, where one individual is passing the virus on uh, to one or more individuals, that the rate needs to be below that. That there are a number, scientifically, uh, as you have heard uh, in these press briefings, there are a number of different uh, measures and different uh, approaches that can be taken uh, to keeping that R level below one, that tr transmission rate below one. Uh, and that is exactly the work of, of SAGE and independent scientific experts to work out what that range of measures look like. And of course, school closures is, is one of those measures. I think it's highly likely that there will be different combinations of measures, uh, some of which are in place at the moment, but others that you have heard about, such as more sophisticated track and tracing, uh, that in combination will keep that number below one. It's the role of the scientists, such as me and others, to uh, look at that and to provide advice, but of course it's the role of government, quite rightly, to look at those and decide which particular combination is the appropriate combination to take forward. Uh, I think on testing, I don't have uh, much to, to add other than to say that testing is clearly expanding at the moment. Uh, in the NHS, we're responsible for testing in hospitals, uh, and we are expanding uh, testing in hospitals. I know outside of hospitals, testing is expanding as well, and I think what's important is that that continues to expand uh, so that those residents in care homes who are symptomatic and asymptomatic and care workers have access to that testing. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, Inigo Gilmore from Channel 4. Call a question to the Minister, if I may. Uh, we've been hearing very serious concerns, Minister, about the lack of public health experts who manage infectious disease outbreaks on your government advisory group, SAGE. We now know that Dominic Cummings and Ben Warner attended, but if you won't tell us who else attended, how can the public get a sense of the balance of their current expertise that you say you're relying on. And secondly, a question to Professor Powers. We've been speaking to a, a local director of public health who says that data is just not being shared by central government and it makes attempts to properly contact, trace and deal with local outbreaks. When is that going to change? And what's your best estimate of when it might be possible to restart contact tracing again? Um, well, the important thing to note is that SAGE is, um, is unusual in the way it operates as an expert advisory group in that it is convened in response to specific emergencies. And the uh, scientists that go on to uh, that group uh, will change depending on the type of the emergency. And it is important uh, that those um, scientists are able to have uh, discussion uh, themselves free of external influence and also um, that we protect uh, their own security as well. So for those reasons, uh, we don't uh, publish uh, the names of those on the group. However, their minutes and their deliberations uh, are published. And Stephen might be able to tell you a little more about that. Yeah, so I have, I'm a member of SAGE, that's in the public domain, and personally I have no uh, problem uh, providing people give permission. I think the Chief Medical Officer's, Officer has said the same with the names of par uh, participants in SAGE uh, being published. Clearly that's not my decision, but I'm perfectly happy for my name to be uh, in the public domain. On the question of contact tracing, uh, you broke up a little bit, but I think the question was when is contact tracing likely to come in and be effective? 
So, so I think there's, there's probably a general comment on contact tracing. Uh, so contact tracing, which is a very uh, tried and tested way of managing outbreaks. Uh, it's more difficult in, a, in an epidemic, but it's certainly a tried and tested way of managing outbreaks. Uh, obviously takes a lot of resource, a lot of time to trace effectively the contacts of an individual person who has tested positive. It can be aided by technology and the development of a digital app will no doubt help in that setting. Uh, but I think the general point is that the lower the number of new cases in the population, uh, the easier it is to do because it involves contacting less uh, people overall. So, you know, to give you a number, if there are 4,000 cases, new cases a day, and you have to contact trace, say, on average 30, that's 120,000 people to contact trace. If it's, if it's 2,000, it's half that. So, so the point is getting the infection rate as low as possible will put us in a position where contact tracing will be at its most effective. So as the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care uh, said here a couple of days ago, Public Health England are building up the capacity to do contact tracing. Technology is being used to develop an app that will, will assist. Uh, but the point at which to introduce that is the point at which we have maintained social distancing, we have driven the infection rate down, and it be, can be introduced in a way that is most effective as possible. So, so the core message is really to continue to comply with the social distancing message, uh, uh, instructions, because by getting the infection rate down, which is, all, which is what is happening at the moment, will get us in the best position uh, for track and trace. Thank you. Um, next, we've got Paul Brand from ITV. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you. Given the Prime Minister's return tomorrow, when do you expect him to follow the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales and start setting out a strategy to potentially begin lifting the lockdown? And on care homes, today the Foreign Secretary said that the number of deaths in care homes was coming down at a similar rate to the number of hospital deaths. What's the evidence for that, please, and can you share it with us? Well, look, on your first point, uh, the Prime Minister has been uh, in all of our thoughts over these last few weeks as he's uh, faced a very difficult encounter with the virus, and we are all uh, delighted that he is uh, going to be back at the helm uh, and returning uh, to work uh, tomorrow. The government has set out its approach, uh, which is that a week ago we decided that it was too early to ease any uh, of those social distancing measures. Um, it will be reviewed again in a couple of weeks' uh, time, uh, and that would be the right moment to uh, consider the uh, scientific evidence that we have, uh, particularly the uh, latest medical evidence. Very important that we don't do this prematurely and risk a second peak. Uh, very important that we see a consistent downward trend uh, and sustainable reduction uh, in the number uh, of infections, and that is our position. But look, I'm sure uh, that at some, at some stage during the course of the uh, week ahead, you will be hearing from the Prime Minister. Um, and Stephen. Yes, so, so I think, as I've, I've said before, I think it's really important to remember uh, that the approach that needs to be taken uh, to keep on top of this virus, to keep uh, transmission down, will need to evolve over time. Uh, and, and it will need to evolve over time because the science and what we know about the virus uh, is, is developing all the time. We are learning more and more. And, and even as we stand here today, there are certain pieces of key information that we would love to have um, to help us plot a way through uh, the coming months it is not available. So, so one piece of information is, is how many people develop immunity uh, to the virus and how long that immunity lasts. And, and the truth of it is, of course, that we won't know how long immunity lasts until we have got some way into this epidemic and we've been able to follow uh, individuals uh, in a serial way, in other words, take blood tests over months to see what happens to their immunity, their antibody levels. And, and as that information becomes available, and there are studies ongoing in this country that will do exactly that and other countries, we will be able to evolve the scientific advice as to how to manage this virus. So, so this is not a sort of binary choice between being in one uh, place and another set of measures. This is going to be a continually evolving approach based on the science and the emerging science uh, as we learn more about it. Great, thank you very much. Um, next we have Heather Stewart from The Guardian. Uh, go ahead, Heather. Hello. Um, you've talked about some of the changes supermarkets have made to make um, uh, delivery slots more available. Um, it's still very, very difficult for people to get a food delivery slot, and some basic foodstuffs are very, very hard to get hold of. I wonder whether shortages of some food products and price increases for others 
a part of the new normal we're going to have to get used to for the next coming months. Well, look, we've been monitoring the food supply chain quite carefully, and uh, to date, there isn't any serious disruption to uh, international trade flows. Um, we're also seeing retail sales, having had that episode in panic buying several weeks ago, return to normal levels now, uh, or in some cases slightly below normal levels. It is the case that the social distancing measures that supermarkets have had to put in place means that there are times when they're not able to restock shelves as freely as they would uh, ordinarily. But that is not a problem of um, food supply. That is um, uh, simply the, the fact that social distancing sometimes makes it harder for them uh, to, to, to get the goods on their shelves. But generally, we've seen a dramatic improvement from the problems that we saw um, three or four weeks ago. Um, the international food supply chain continues to work well, although uh, there are isolated cases of trade being, being disrupted, particularly, for instance, some goods coming um, from India. Uh, but most of our trade with um, uh, near neighbours uh, in, uh, in Europe is continuing to, to flow uh, normally. We're also acutely aware that we're about to start the um, British season in fresh produce, in uh, soft fruits and uh, salads. Uh, we estimate that probably only about a third of the migrant labour that would normally come to the UK uh, is here and was probably here before lockdown. And we are working with industry to identify um, uh, an approach that will encourage uh, those uh, millions of furloughed uh, workers, in some cases, to consider taking a, uh, a second job, helping get the harvest in in June. It's not a, an issue at the moment, since the harvest has barely begun, uh, but we do anticipate that there will be a need to help recruit uh, staff for those sectors in the month of June. Um, Kate Ferguson from The Sun. Hi, thank you, Secretary of State. One question for you and one for Stephen Powers. Um, to you, we've seen reports in the newspapers today that passengers arriving in Britain will be told to quarantine for two weeks. How are you going to be enforcers? Will police be making spot checks? And if lockdown is eased and Brits can go on their summer holidays, will they have to take another two weeks off work to self-isolate back home here when they return? And to um, Mr. Power, we've seen today's death figures are the lowest that they have been this month. You've previously spoken about green shoots. Are we turning a corner and are we through the peak now? Thank you. Well, on your, your first point, I know there's a lot of speculation uh, around these things. And I think the, uh, the, the, the point is this, that as we move to a, um, a new phase at some point in the future, we're not there yet and not ready to make that decision yet, um, international travel could become um, a more significant um, part of the risk to manage. At the moment, all of the evidence suggests uh, that it is only a tiny proportion of the, um, um, of, of the um, cause of um, the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, if we got to that uh, point, you know, a number of measures would be considered, but no, no decisions have been even taken in this space yet. We've taken a conscious decision as a country not to close our borders. It is important that we keep trade flowing, and um, should there be medical advice at some point in the future as we move uh, to new stages that this is an area that should be looked at and considered, uh, then uh, obviously that is the time to do that. Thank you. So I think when you go back a number of weeks ago when I uh, started presenting, as others do, the, the charts that we present at the start of these briefings, uh, what I was pointing out was that as we begin, began to see reductions in the use of transport, uh, indicating that the British public were beginning uh, to comply uh, with the guidance that had been issued on social distancing, uh, that if that was sustained, then over time it would translate into a reduction in the number of cases, a reduction in the number of hospital admissions, and then finally through a reduction uh, in the number of deaths. And of course, a number of weeks ago, those charts all showed that infections and hospital admissions people in critical care and deaths were on the increase. Uh, over the last few weeks, of course, we have seen, because those social distances measures have been adhered to, uh, that those curves have started to change. And as I showed you just a few minutes ago, we are now beginning to see declines, uh, uh, particularly in London. Uh, and yes, uh, deaths are uh, now uh, either plateauing around the country or beginning uh, to decline. But, but I should emphasize that, that those benefits have only occurred 
not by luck, as I've said before, but because people have complied with the instructions that we've all been given. And they have followed the science. So the science of this is quite straightforward. If we reduce uh, the number of people that uh, can be infected from an individual person who has the virus to below on average one, then the virus starts to go into decline and the number of infections uh, start to fall. That is, that is the simple principle behind the measures uh, of social distancing. Uh, and, and what you have seen is all our efforts, hard though they might be, have begun to pay off. But of course, the other point to make uh, there, of course, is that uh, it will only continue to pay off if we continue to keep social distancing and we continue to comply with those messages. Because, of course, my fear, uh, as the fear of all of us is, is that those curves won't continue to be on a downward trend, uh, but will start to go on an upward trend. And we're not at the point that any of us can be absolutely confident uh, that that's not going to be the case. We, we want to avoid a second peak. We want to avoid a rise. And so I can't emphasize enough uh, that this is not the time to say, actually, we've done a good job. We need to stop uh, complying with our social distancing instructions and the government guidance. This is exactly the time to keep that up. It's exactly the time. And that's why when I showed you the transport uh, graphs and curves earlier, that slight uptick uh, in motor vehicles, that slight uptick in the use of Apple Maps, we need to keep a close eye on that. We all need to remind ourselves that this has been a really tough four weeks and we don't want to lose the benefits that have come from this. We need to keep going and we need to make sure the number of uh, infections continues to decline. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, Jen Williams from the Manchester Evening News. Hi, thank you. Um, a question first for the Minister, if I may, and then one for, for both of you. Um, councils are clearly on the front line of delivering social care during the pandemic. And so far, the government has promised £3.2 billion extra for local government. Uh, but one Conservative councillor I spoke to today said that while it's welcome, it's merely a sticking plaster for what's to come. Greater Manchester's 10 councils alone are forecasting a financial hit of more than half a billion pounds for this financial year, and leaders are warning of catastrophic cuts to services if ministers don't help further. So will government make good on its promise to do whatever it takes and commit to fully reimbursing councils for their losses? Um, and secondly, I just wanted to come back to the question that Paul Brand asked earlier on about um, death in care homes and what the evidence actually is currently that they are falling and probably something that I would add to that. Why were deaths in care homes not factored into the same kind of counting as deaths in hospitals at the start of this? Was that an oversight or what's the actual reason for the fact that we didn't start this process with a daily care home uh, death figure? Thank you. Well, look, the, uh, the government, of course, recognises that these are extraordinary times and uh, local authorities have indeed uh, taken on additional uh, burdens to to help get through this crisis and it's in recognition of that as you alluded to in your question that uh, Robert Jenrick uh, announced a package of additional financial support uh, for local authorities um, you know we estimate that that is uh, uh, that that's that's the right approach to uh, support them through this difficult time of course some of the uh, things that they're doing now um, they're often um, are geared up to do anyway and they have their own uh, emergency uh, response centers and uh, emergency response procedures that are that are in place and that they do uh, on a regular basis but we recognize that there are new burdens and that's why uh, there's been uh, that additional financial package announced uh, by the Secretary of State in uh, MHCLG. I will turn now to Steve. Yes so point. thank you so, so, so obviously um, as NHS England National Medical Director uh, I am uh, most concerned with uh, uh, the reporting of deaths within hospitals. Of course, we care about all deaths, absolutely, but uh, the mechanism of reporting deaths in hospitals falls within NHS England and, of course, the other devolved administrations. So I think it's worth pointing out there's important differences about the way the data is collected. Uh, within the NHS, uh, we are work, work with several hundred hospitals uh, in order to collect that data uh, on a daily basis. And we're collecting the data from people who have died in hospital who we know have tested pos positive. So that's one important thing to remember. Um, the NHS, uh, all those organisations are within the NHS family. They're all NHS organisations who are used to putting in daily reports to, in, in my case, NHS England. Uh, so there's a very, uh, uh, there's a system that already exists, for instance, that we use during winter pressures, that means that it's very straightforward for those trusts to 
to report that data on a daily basis. Uh, in the care home sector, of course, there are many, many thousands of care homes uh, uh, operated by many, many different uh, independent organisations. And so that sort of daily rhythm of reporting in uh, is just not something uh, that, that occurs in, in care homes in the same way. And then, of course, the other important difference is, as I said, in hospitals, what we're reporting is deaths where we know somebody is tested positive. Uh, in the community, uh, deaths that are being reported is deaths where the registration process, the doctor who is certified death, has put COVID-19 on the death certificate. And then that has gone through the usual death certification process. And it's the Office for National Statistics, as I said earlier, that gathers that data. And, in, and, and as I'm sure everybody knows, that process takes uh, several days and can take longer. So again, as I said earlier, I know uh, colleagues in government are looking to speed that up, but there, there is an inevitable longer time uh, for those deaths to be recorded and the very quick reporting that we can get on a daily basis uh, within the NHS. So, so it simply reflects the differences in the two process, processes and the difference uh, in what we're reporting in terms of test positive deaths in hospitals and death certificates uh, in the community. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and um, we're out of time. I simply wanted to, to conclude, though, by uh, recording my thanks and paying tribute to all of those who are working throughout the food supply chain from uh, farmers, manufacturers and retailers, uh, the response of this uh, industry uh, to ensure that we have the food as a country that we need has been truly uh, phenomenal. Uh, but thank you all very much. <laughs>